start anytime. Okay, great. Thank you, Sandy. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Valerie and I am the Director of Strategic Alliances and Partnerships at Democracy. And I'm also the coordinator of the Connecticut City Health Project. Uh, I want to welcome all of you, uh, especially our Connecticut Civic Ambassadors, to this Zoom event, Civility and Civil Discourse in an Age of Divisiveness. Our goal today is to learn more about civility and civil discourse and their significance for our communities and democracy by answering these questions. What are the aims of civil discourse? Has the call for civility and civil discourse always advanced the goals of building a better, more just democratic society? Does civility and civil discourse mean the same for everyone? And what are the distinctions? Can they both uh, still exist in the context of strong disagreement? And if so, how can we create spaces for this to happen? Before we start, however, I want to share with you uh, some brief housekeeping information about our Zoom, meet, uh, Zoom meeting today. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available for future viewing. Please mute yourself unless you are speaking to reduce background noise. Your audio video controls are on the lower left corner of your screen. Just move your cursor to the lower left corner and you'll see that. You can minimize or move your video boxes at any time by going to the top section of your screen. You can access a chat box at the bottom of your screen to write comments. And again, just uh, move your cursor to the bottom and you'll see where it says. Any questions? All right. So at this point, I want to ask that each of you uh, very briefly introduce yourselves with your name and organizational affiliation and what brought you to participate in this event. Please mention also if you are a civic ambassador. So again, name, affiliation, and what brought you to participate uh, in this event today. Anyone can start. So I, I'm happy to start. I'm Duncan Holloman. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I'm a rec recovering lawyer and a psychotherapist, but I've also been interested in these questions of civil discourse for quite a while. Um, I worked with Carolyn Lukensmeyer years ago um, on her medical speech project, did a number of, of projects with her, and I'm connected with Essential Partners here in Cambridge, which does wonderful work with structured dialogue. Great to have you, thank you. Hi, I can go next. Um, I'm Lisa Matthews, I'm Program Director for National Conference on Citizenship, and I'm more or less interested in this uh, subject matter um, for all facets of the work that I do personally and professionally. Um, I work with uh, people um, in my community Ability, and a lot of times they don't feel that they have a seat at the table. And so I'm just more or less curious um, about the subject and just want to be able to hear and learn and be able to dive into the conversation where I feel that I can add some value or just some thoughts. So thanks for including me. Well, thank you, Lisa, for joining us. By the way, Lisa uh, works for the National Conference on Citizenship, uh, which is our national partner on the City Health Project. So we're delighted to have you, Lisa, and also. NCLC to be with us today. Thanks again, Val. Um, my name is Wendy Habel. I'm a psychologist and owner of Beacon Behavioral Services based in West Hartford. Um, I uh, provide, along with my um, employees, a range of behavioral health services to children, adolescents, and adults. Um, I am particularly connected to the issue of civility and the work that I do um, to help separating and divorced families, um, the parents to co-parent in a collaborative manner. And um, I'm particularly interested in this topic as Val and I sat on a Colin McEnroe panel um, together in the fall talking about civility in this um, 
currently tumultuous po particular uh, political time. So I'm also happy to be here and to learn more um, about civility and civil discourse. Thank you for joining us, Wendy. Great to have you here. Hello everyone, my name is Don Padgett. I'm the president of Hartford Community Leaders, it's a violent pre prevention organization in the city of Hartford, and I'm just here uh, to learn more about civil discourse and talk to you about civil discourse. Uh, Don, welcome to this uh, event. And by the way, Don is a Connecticut Civic Ambassador. So welcome, Don. Thank you so much. Hi, this is um, Steve Armstrong, and I'm the uh, Social Studies Consultant at the Connecticut State Department of Education and a past president of National Council for the Social Studies. And Sally Whipple of, of the Connecticut Democracy Center and the, old, and the Connecticut State Department of Education are just starting our first session tomorrow on um, doing collaborative conversations. We've got a number of schools scheduled. We're gonna be out in high schools uh, in, in the next month. Um, and I'm in, we're interested in perfecting our game here. So looking forward to this presentation. Welcome, Steve, great to have you here. Um, Steve is also a Connecticut Civic Ambassador. Thank you very much, I forgot that, my apologies. Okay. Uh, Yesenia, you want to introduce yourself? Go ahead, Sally. Anybody else out there want to introduce themselves? Otherwise, maybe we want to uh, move along. I'm, uh, I'll just say I'm Sandy with Everyday Democracy, so um, anything I can do to help the conversation today, um, I'm looking forward to listening as well. Great. So I know some of you may be having problems with the audio, um, and at some point later, if you were able to hear you, you can, uh, of course, introduce yourself. So now I'm very, uh, thank you all, by the way, and I'm very, very pleased to introduce our speaker and discussion moderator today, Dr. Dana Miranda. Uh, Dr. Dana Francisco Miranda just defended his doctoral thesis in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut Stores, and he graduates with a PhD later this month. So congratulations, Dana. Thank you. Um, his research covers political philosophy, Africana uh, philosophy, and 19th century and contemporary European thought. His current work investigates the role of dialogue in fostering a better society, uh, he currently co-runs the Initiative on Campus Dialogues at UConn and the Encounter Series sponsored by the UConn Humanities Institute. Dr. Miranda is also a Connecticut Civic Ambassador and has participated in our Civic Ambassador Summit. He also serves on the Connecticut Civic Health Advisory Group and he is also a Connecticut Civic Ambassador. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dana Miranda. Thank you, Al. So I am hearing background noise, but um, before I begin, can everyone hear me? If we could hear a little louder, that would be better, Dana. So you could bring up the volume a little bit. Can everyone hear me? Is this better? That's better, yes. Okay, perfect. I'll speak at this volume. Um, so once again, this presentation will be on the discourse in an age of... So, uh, just a brief pause, Steve, if you wouldn't mind muting your screen, um, just with the sound of the rapper. But once again, to begin, so this conversation is gonna function more of a brief lecture, a workshop, there's gonna be a lot of interaction. So one thing I did wanna mention, it should either appear on the top or bottom of your screen. Um, it's basically a feature that has the mute stop video participants. And at the very end, it says more. And if you click on more, um, right underneath should say a chat. 
And so we'll be using a chat box throughout. So you can exit out of this chat box throughout the presentation, um, but we will be using it. So I just want it to be easily located and accessible. So as Val said, I will be giving a conversation on civility and civil discourse. Um, Val will be a moderator and really pull things out towards the end. Um, but this will be a very free flowing conversation. We're going to talk about civility to begin with and then civil discourse. So before I begin any type of dialogue or work, whether it's a lecture, a uh, teaching class, a presentation, I always like situating my actual locality. And so this is a land acknowledgement made by the Aquama Educational Initiative, who partners with us at UConn. So again, I'll briefly say this land acknowledgement because I am currently situated in Connecticut, but please feel free to use this land acknowledgement to adapt it to your current environment or locale um, to just pay attention to the land we're on. So we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the occupied territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shkadakoke, Golden Hill, Pagasset, and Nympux people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to the example. So again, this is a land acknowledgement that we begin every public dialogue with, um, even if it's on alchemy, even if it's on a public bipartisan issue, we just think that it's very important to have a land acknowledgement. And we can talk more about that towards the end of the presentation. So in terms of the actual activities for today, so we're gonna be separated into three rounds. So round one, we'll really be talking about what is civility? What are some common definitions? What are both the positive and negative connotations using both the NICD, National Institute for Civil Discourse, the work of Martin Luther King Jr., as well as Lynn Itagaki. And then in round two, we'll be talking about, well, what is civic discourse, civil discourse, um, more liberatory forms of dialogue, and this will come from the National Issues Forum in the work of a philosopher, Maisha Cherry. And lastly, round through, we'll talk about challenges and activities. So again, because this is less than an hour at this point of time, these are more just to spur your thinking, your critical thoughts about if you want to have um, discourses around civility in your own community, how would that actually look like? What, is the, what are your own internal mechanisms that you need to do beforehand? And how could you actually bring these discourses or dialogues to the public? So to begin with, we have two different quotes about what civility is. So the first is, again, from the NICD. And <clears throat> it's really focused on civility is showing mutual respect. So these are really focused on behaviors or words that are meant to convey respect during disagreement. So we have a sense of civility is very important to dialogue, to speaking across differences to speaking with one another because it allows us to speak in a way where we can disagree, but it's done in a respectful manner. Um, now, the quote opposite by Itagaki really points to um, the relativism when we have the term civility. So what type of behaviors or words are civil? Now, for Itagaki, she really wants to point to the ways that civility can be another person's incivility. So throughout the presentation, I'll start talking about cultural differences and have us think critically about, well, how are we measuring this political co concept and goal, civility, if there are cultural differences? So in my group in New England and Connecticut or Massachusetts, what's civil behavior look like? But if I move across the West Coast, if I'm in California, are there gonna be differences? Or if I move in different populations, does civility have a different tinge or meaning to it? So again, we have this notion of civility as mutual respect, but also being re very relative to the communities or locales you're located. Now, for this slide, I also wanted to give you other connotations of what civility has been defined or thought of in popular literature, in philosophy, um, and in discourse or dialogue work. So we have first civility as an ad hominem attack. And this is really saying that if I can characterize your behavior as uncivil, barbarous, savage, then I actually don't have to deal with the content of your critique. 
So if we're in a dialogue and someone really has a poignant critique against an issue, so if you have climate change, I really disagree with your argument, but I'm doing it in a way that you find is not proper or respectful, we don't actually have to deal with the content of the critique. But as I said, um, or as the NICD wants to point out, civility is also allows for respectful dialogue. If we all have the proper behavior, if we're all conveying respect, then we can have discussions about tough issues. We can have discussions about the issues that really matter in our community. And this is why civility has been known to cultivate an atmosphere of trust. That if I'm speaking in the right way, showing the right manners and behaviors, then we can have an actual area where we're trusting towards one another. And with that trust, we can then, um, to our fourth point, build common ground. So if we have deep disagreements in our community, if we can agree to at least be civil with one another, speak amongst each other with respect and um, difference, um, then we can possibly achieve common ground on the issues we really care about. So if we want to, again, solve climate change, deal with gun control issues in our country. Civility is a way where people with different opinions and different beliefs can come together and at least achieve um, a end goal. Now, the last four also have certain connotations, some negative, some positive, depending on your persuasion. We have civility as decorum that really points to um, popular mannerisms. So what is culturally appropriate can be defined as civility. But because we always embody or move through different cultures, the notion of civility can also move or shift depending on your locale. And this is why for a lot of marginalized populations, for people of color, the notion of civility um, really has a ne negative connotation of deference. So I'm gonna defer to the most popular or majority opinion um, of, of the definition of civility even if my community has a different notion. Now for these last two, and particularly the last one, I wanna thank Val for really bringing up this notion of civility as the glue that can hold us together as the jointly, um, joint behaviors and mannerisms. But again, what is the us being defined here? What are the popular manner mannerisms that we all are agreeing together on this joint us? So for civility, who is the we, who is the us defining what is civil or not? And as people interested in the term civility or interested in dialogue work or our civic ambassadors, it's very important to know that even with popular definitions, the communities you work with may have different accounts of what's civility, what is proper, how you actually operate in that community in a respectful way. So when we're saying us, civility is the glue that holds us together, it's always helpful to say, well, let's actually have a conversation of what this us is composed of and what we actually want to be um, the aims and goals of this community. And lastly, um, but not least, we have civility as a way of healthily disagreeing. So if I'm civil towards one another, we can again get to the NICD manner of disagreeing in a respectful and healthy way. And part of this notion really comes from civic health, which as a Connecticut civic ambassador is one of our mandates. So at this moment, these are just eight brief definitions of civility. So they have both positive and negative connotations. We've had the past slide with Itagaki's and the NICD's work. So if we can open up our chat boxes, and again, um, it appears on my top screen, but I, from Val, it's on his bottom screen. If you can just click on the more and open up your chat box, I would just like us to take two minutes to really map out different definitions of civility. So what does civility mean for you? So because of the audio issues, um, I think we, we can just use the chat box to really think of what are some other ways we can um, think of civility and have a deeper conversation. Um, and moreover, we can save the chat box and send it to everyone. So we have more definitions to work with, not only throughout this presentation, but throughout our own work. And yes, thank you, Sandy. All the slides will also be available later.
again, um, two minutes, you can take your time, but just some alternative thoughts of what civility means for you. How are we civil towards one another? How do you use civility in your own work? Or is it, I will add another one just to start things going. Civility. So for me, another definition or in my own work, you can categorize civility as allowing for collaboration. And thank you, Lisa. All right, so I'm just going to do 45 more seconds to see if we can get any other thoughts. And again, you can keep the chat box open as we move through. You can exit and enter back into it, and it'll save your words, so you don't have to worry of the thoughts being erased. Thank you, Sally and Yesenia. Thank you, Wendy, Steve. All right, and again, you guys can keep on writing your own thoughts. I'm just gonna move on with the presentation due to time constraints. So with these more positive definitions of civility um, that I briefly had a chance to look at and we'll keep looking at even after this presentation, I also wanted to point to the work of civil disobedience particularly the work of Martin Luther King Jr. points to the ways that civility can also have a negative connotation. Um, the last slide showed some very positive feedbacks. Civility as the glue that holds us together, civility as respectful dialogue, as an atmosphere of trust. But particularly in the quotes that I highlighted, Martin Luther King in his letter from Birmingham Jail really critiques what he calls white moderates that seek a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, rather than a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. And the reason why I really wanted to take this excerpt from the letter from Birmingham Jail is because I think MLK is pointing to something in political philosophy, particularly the work of Isaiah Berlin, that when we have this idea of our values, so what do we actually value in the world? Do we value civility, freedom, respect, um, mutual collaboration, um, love. We have all these values in the world, but one thing political philosophy really points to is, is to say, why do we presume all our values can actually be collaborative? And I think what MLK is pointing to here is that sometimes this negative piece, this notion of a lukewarm acceptance, um, which for a lot of minorities that I've worked with, is wrapped up in this notion of civility is actually in conflict with the notion of justice. So in some marginalized communities that I work with, that I study and read, the notion of civility, of being civilized, of really deferring to the behaviors and modes of operation in the dominant culture isn't really justice for them. It's a way of deferring the negative piece acceptance without the real, um, multitude or beauty of their difference. So for me, again, when we talk about civility, I just wanted to also give us some negative connotation. That's not to say that civility is only the negative connotation, but when we're working in communities, are we using the term civility to connote respectful dialogue? Yes, we can go into community with this positive attribute, but how is the community actually taking up our action? Are they seeing civility being used to really defer? So if I speak with my hands and I get very animated about racism or topic, is that uncivil behavior? Do we have to regulate that behavior? Or can we understand that we, we can't just lukewarm accept that as that's the way that person communicates? We actually have to realize that that mode of communication might be in conflict with modes of justice. So how can we really think of civility as working with our other values or when do they conflict? 
So for me, these, and I'm gonna put up another slide of them, okay? What I really wanted us to take a deep pause and critically reflect on is with all these positive connotations and attributes of civility, when do they actually conflict in the communities we wanna work with? And so now I'm gonna bring up a lesser known speech by Martin Luther King Jr., The Other America. And so this is a five year difference. So within these five years, we have the Civil Disobedient March, the Freedom Rides, but also MLK being more radicalized in his approach with the Poor People's Movement. And so in the other America, he's talking about the notion of rioting. And so for MLK, we know from really a lot of our high school and college education that MLK is a figure of not only civil disobedience, but also nonviolence. But in this speech, he points to it would be morally irresponsible to criticize rioting. So for MLK, he, he, he doesn't want to think of rioting as a politically efficient method of gaining right or justice. So he still doesn't incorporate it into his own work, but he says it's morally irresponsible to condemn rioting without also condemning the conditions that make rioting possible. And he talks about a riot as a language of the unheard. And what has this other America failed to hear? What has failed to hear that the tranquility and status quo that um, white moderates, large segments of the American population enjoy, aren't enjoyed by this other America. And he's not only talking about African Americans, he's talking about Jews, um, Latinx communities that are placed in these segregated communities where there's deep poverty, um, large mortality rate. And he talks in a sense that there are two Americas in the world. In America where you have tranquility, um, peace, um, your values are protected. And in this other slice of America, in these other cities, we don't have our justice and humanity respected. The rioting is one form for people to actually be heard. But again, if we're talking about rioting, most people would consider rioting as a form of incivility. It's the point where conversation breaks down, that you have a riot occur. But I think MLK points very deftly to the fact that, well, again, if civility is this form of status quo, this form of negative peace, the absence of tension, then we're actually not having justice being achieved and we're not having our humanity or the humanities of others being respected. So again, MLK is pointing to a notion of civility that is really opposed to justice. So in our own work, again, think critically of what values do we actually want operative in our community and how can we work, join them together? So for me, I'm okay. Yes, he's pointing to some of the de deficits of civility, but he's also pointing to ways in which we can improve civility. How can we um, pair up civility with justice? What would that look like in our own community? And if you notice on my left screen, we have a picture of a riot occur. This is a riot that actually occurred after MLK's assassination. And so what do the individuals in largely black communities and major cities across the United States, what were they communicating during this riot? Why was civility, why was dialogue not possible? What conditions made that impossible? So for me, when I use the term civility, I always have this background notion in my head, or am I using civility? to really speak to another person, to really hear what they want to say? Or is it just a way of communicating that I'm actually comfortable with? So again, I'm comfortable with talking with my hands. There's other forms of communication that I shy away from. So if someone gets too loud, I automatically assume that levels of anger are rising. But this might not be the case. So again, just taking a pause and seeing, how am I communicating with others and what communication is needed for justice, for freedom, for the values that I actually want to embody in my community? Now, moving from the 1960s, we also have a current work that also examines um, what Lynn Itagaki calls racial civility. 
So in her book, uh, sorry, her book, Civil Racism, that actually came out in 2016, she talks about civil racism as often appearing as what she calls racial civility. And she defines these as a practices and behaviors where racialized subjects, people of color, marginalized communities are expected to behave in certain ways for either assimilation or even to achieve certain protections of citizenship. So it's not a natural way of communication or it's not a natural behavior or practices that they actually embody in their own communities, but it's a form of civility that is really demanded upon racialized people in order to enjoy some of the benefits or protections. So if we're using MLK to talk about the status quo or tranquility, how is civility used to police the actions and behaviors of racialized populations? So again, I really just wanted to have a more modern definition of racial civility besides the MLK to show that from 2016 to 1963 and 1968, we have these notions of civility for marginalized populations as having very negative connotation. And so when I speak with communities, um, black, brown, um, red communities, one of the issues that I found very quickly is that if I use the notion of civility, we have the connotations of civilizing that I have to police your behavior in order for us to communicate our, across difference. But I also see all these positive connotations that you have also written on the chat box as respectful dialogue, as being mutually collaborative. So for me is really trying to find a way that what is civility? It's nuance. We can't just assume that we're working with a positive definition, that we can go into communities and say, let's have a talk about civility. Let's be civil with one another if there's so many different connotations. So this is um, the first part of my talk, round one. What is civility? Nuance. <laughs> it's not one thing. Um, but that also benefits us because it can be many things for us. We can really tailor it to what we want for our community. So in moving forward, I then want to also talk rather briefly about what is civil discourse. Now, this question could be posed over two, three hours, two days even, of what is a civil discourse? What do we actually mean? Um, in particular, I wanted to have the notion of, do you need civility to have a civil discourse? Is the notion civility necessary to actually have a civil discourse? But again, we had to define or really find the meanings behind what is a civil discourse? What do we mean? And so from the national issue forms, they rather neatly separate um, forms of communication. Now, these are not the only forms, but in terms of working with communities, these are the three most popular forms of discourse. So we have debate, dialogue, and deliberation. Now, I want to briefly pause and say that I believe that you can have civil forms of discourse representative in each category. So you can have debates that are very civil that lead to um, civic health in your community. You can have dialogues, you can have deliberation. They each have their own intended purposes. And as we see, we have some um, complementary definitions or nuanced meanings towards each. So again, I know some audios aren't working, but if for each category, so for debate, dialogue, and deliberation, if I just have someone in the audience in the Zoom event really just point to one that they think is very interesting or can compare and contrast what's in one category that's not in the other. And then I'll also explain a little bit more about each as well. Yeah, one o'clock, so I'm going to run it real quick. I'll be back. Not everybody. Tina, did you want everybody to pipe in verbally or on the chat box? So I think we can do verbally. If audios aren't working, again, you can use the chat box because I have it up. 
They should be working. Just make sure you unmute yourself on your end. We can you repeat the intent of what you wanted to speak on, um, what's in one of the columns that's not in the other? Is that kind of what you were asking? Yes, yeah, so we can do a compare and contrast. So what do you notice in one um, version of the scores that's not in the other? Or something that really pulled to you, that you agreed with? I guess for me, this is Lisa, um, that a lot of times when I, when I look at the word debate and I see the, the distinction there between um, arguing, discuss, and decide, that a lot of times when people are debating, it's like they have to come to some sort of a resolve that um, they have to be particularly right about an issue or the other person has to be wrong, whereas the dialogue and deliberating that you're actually having kind of back and forth where you may not come up with an agreement of what you feel on a particular issue, but that you are you could potentially be doing that in a sense of uh, gaining that mutual respect and understanding that there will be different. Just build upon that due to time constraints. I do want to say that that argue, discuss, and decide are some of the key elements. That can you that? Can you, I think it's because of the background noise. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so I was just briefly saying to add on to your points that when we point to argue, discuss, and decide, those are mm -hmm. some of the key features that define both debate, dialogue, and deliberation. So with the debate, we're arguing where if you go a little bit further down to here, where you're hearing the other person's statements, but you're doing so in order to complete your own argument and in a sense to win the contest. So it's right. more of a sense of competition. So if anyone watches the West Wing, um, I always love the Matthew Santos debate where they said, we're not going to go with a scripted two minutes response. We're just really going to debate each other, debate the idea. And for me, the West Wing showed a particularly civic um, and healthy form of debate where they were arguing, but they're arguing not in terms of just hearing to knock down an opponent's argument, but they're also embodying some components of listening to really respecting that the other person actually had ideas and values mm -hmm. that were human. So the other person wasn't evil. You weren't trying to defeat them because they're wrong, but because you had a disagreement. Okay. And now we're trying to understand each other's opinion. And then if you more move to dialogue, this discussion is not about arguments, it's about really trying to listen to the other person to understand them. And so this is the mode of discourse that I use most frequently in my own work. Yeah. I'm not trying to debate or form argumentations. I'm not trying to have communities decide on an action, which is deliberation. But really, if we're gonna ever achieve common ground for me, one thing that actually has to be done is we actually have to enter into public um, communities with our actual voices being heard, our opinions being heard um, and seen and being really valued and affirmed that I'm taking the time to listen to you. And even if we have disagreements, I know it's coming from your background, from your beliefs, and I can respect that. So again, that form of healthy disagreement um, that form of civility, I think, can still be operative in the three of those each categories. But for the rest of this, um, again, brief talk slash workshop slash interaction, I'm going to really focus on versions of dialogue because this is what I work with most frequently. So in terms of the structure of a dialogue, so this is more meant to um, give you a baseline or skeleton structure of how I form dialogues. So when I do my own facilitation training or teach people how to create their own dialogues, I always give them the piece of paper or the slide with this information. So we have a welcome. So Val did this earlier. Hey, this is the actual talk going on. These are our partners. Here are some house rules. Can we do introductions? Just go around briefly if your audio is working so we get to know the people in the room. We have ground rules. So one thing we didn't do in this conversation, but I do in all my dialogues, is we need a set behavior or standards that we can add to 
in the room, but at least the baseline, so on our time. So make sure everyone has a chance to be heard. Um, these are just some examples of ground rules that I found very helpful in having dialogues. That we can always refer back to the facilitator, the moderator can go back and, hey, remember when we agreed that we'd follow, that we'd be respectful, that we'd listen to each other? The, that's actually what's allowing us to speak to one another. And then also icebreakers. So we can do this rather easily to say like, the people in the room haven't met each other before. How do we get them speaking comfortably with one another? And ra rather lastly, um, oh, sorry. I was trying to get out of the chat. Um, in terms of the heart of the dialogue, I just really want to focus on questions and facilitation. So a version of dialogue is we're trying to create open-ended question because we don't want people just saying yes or no but also we're trying to uncover more of their beliefs and values. So you leave it open-ended so they can go anywhere within the parameters of the dialogue. And for our facilitators, especially if you're the one creating a civil dialogue or civil discourse, please remember your aim is to move the conversation forward, not to control it or make everyone agree with your own beliefs. And this is very important because as I mistakenly moved to the next slide too early, we're gonna talk about forms of dialogue that are in what we call civil discourse um, that really turn what our aims are upside down. So in terms of Maisha Cherry's work, um, a philosopher at UCLA, she talks about ways in which dialogue, even when we have the best of intentions, even if we're calling it civil or civic, can be really, um, moved outside the parameters. So in particular, she talks about a sales dialogue. And so I have the figure of a salesman who's going into a dialogue saying that he or she wants to hear from others. They want to understand each other's positions. But as soon as you sit down, you hear them, you know they have a set two minutes or three minute monologue. They have, they're coming into the dialogue to persuade people. So sales dialogue, we can see that persuasion is the main aim. That the person speaking in the dialogue is not really listening to each other, he's not trying to gain more knowledge, not trying to be challenged, um, but really, it's just taking in other people's thoughts to really manipulate that to complete the end goal. So I've had this actually occur in uh, open dialogue. So we have these ground rules, we have um, this purpose where we're trying to hear from one another. And yet, as a facilitator, I can see that dialogue being transformed into persuasion. And so it's being transformed more into debate. And so we want to be very careful that if we're talking about a civil discourse, how it can be very easily upended when people have their own different intentions. So we always have to be on the watch, per se, for the salesperson. So who's coming to the dialogue really just to say their piece and then not listen to anyone? Or who's trying to convince everyone to agree with them? And how can we walk that back? Now, another form of dialogue that Cherry points to is a Socratic dialogue. And so this is a form of dialogue that as a philosopher, um, the figure Socrates, the Greek philosopher, is very heavy um, in my own training. Um, and in philosophy classes. So you have a professor or teacher, or even in dialogues that one individual who says, well, I, I don't know anything. Um, tell me your thoughts. So if it's on socialism, if it's on democratic socialism, climate change, gun control, tell me what you believe. And I'll keep asking you, well, why is that? Don't you see a problem with this? And so as the individual, as the Socrates in this example, I'm asking you questions because I want to really give you more self-knowledge, but also show the ways in which we're ignorant. Now, as a philosopher in a philosophy class, that might be very helpful, but as a form of dialogue, it has its own flaws in the sense that individuals or my, the, the one who is playing at Socrates doesn't actually have their own thoughts challenged. And so what I really try to tell students or participants and facilitators is to never be Socrates in a civil discourse or in a civic dialogue. 
you want to be curious. So you can ask someone, can you tell me more on that? But you're not going into it to show other people's ignorance. Because we also have to be aware that a dialogue occurs between people. So how can we be curious with one another and allow people to also be curious about our own thoughts, beliefs, and opinions? So don't take on the position of, I need to be the devil's advocate, the challenger, the Socrates in dialogues. But really, how can I be curious? And I think this really goes to what um, Chari's main point and her last form of dialogue that she looks at, which is liberatory dialogue. Now, liberatory dialogue is focused on, again, this notion of curiosity or what she calls discovering and humanization. So how can we humanize each other in order to understand and what she calls critically co-investigate? So how can we be co critical co-investigators in the process of gaining knowledge about each other? How can we discover more about each other? And a dialogue really has this aim. I'm here to listen to you in order to understand you. And in the process, also understand more about myself. So it's always, in a sense, a two-way street. Um, in a liberatory dialogue. So if the goal is not persuasion, it's not to help individuals gain more knowledge per se, but rather to have each other grow in that community and really speak to one another and discover one another. Now, with that being said, I do want to point to, again, the cultural difference notion. Now, for me, these cultural differences um, are what I call dialogic dialects. So when I said I speak with my hands a lot, but sometimes because of the environments I'm in or the rooms I'm in, I close my hands and put them down because I know how that'll come across. That doesn't mean that there are still forms of communication that I shy away with or shy away from and are still learning to deal with in a liberatory or humanizing fashion. So for me, the example I always give are people that speak too closely. Um, for me, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's very uncomfortable. Um, we can say I have an imaginary bubble, um, but it's still a form of communication that is not being done maliciously. It's just a natural form of communicating. And if we move then to this one person's dialect, to a community's dialect, so what happens if a community or a family, the way they communicate with each other is through speaking rather loudly? Are we gonna shut down that conversation because we think things are getting out of hand? Or can we take a step back and say, well, is this a different dialogic dialect that I'm dealing with? If so, how can I incorporate that again into a notion of civility? So we have both positive and negative definitions, but if we're going for a more liberatory versions of civility, how can we incorporate some cultural differences? And so for this form, our slide, I really wanted us to think critically of some cultural differences you notice um, when communicating with others. So what are some cultural differences you have or that you notice moving to different places? So if I go to Baltimore, Maryland, I know Old Bay seasoning will be on everything. New England, um, they might use Lowry's. Um, if I go to more Spanish or Portuguese environments, adobo. So we can talk about seasoning um, for not only our food, but also the way we talk with one another. We're, we're used to forms of communication that we can find civil, but are we going to require code switching or are we going to require um, a community, a dialogue where each can be respected in their form of communication? And I think that's very important if we're going to liberate civility. And I also um, wanted to point out, so Val rather briefly talked about um, me being the co-leader on a three-year dialogue project in Hartford called Encounters. And so at every Encounters, we also leave people with dialogic tips. So if we're really framing the conversation as we have um, some ground rules, but also at the very end, we also have some tips to move the conversation forward. When encounters is a completely structured dialogue. We give you the time, two minutes to speak, um, one minute to listen, one minute to reflect, um, 
10 minutes to do group reading. So everything is completely structured, but we know that we exist in communities where you can't demand that on people. But we still think that you can have these dialogic tips and move forward to actively listen and reflect on your conversation. To not change the other person's opinion, that shouldn't be your goal in a dialogue. It might be in a civil um, debate, but at least in a civil dialogue, you have to be very careful of the persuader or the salesperson. We also find that having a common source or text is very helpful. But what can we all focus on together and do readings or viewings? So we can say you're not bringing in outside opinions, but we're really just focused on this so I can understand you better. And we think in doing that, um, you can almost achieve or it's possible to achieve common grounding. So common ground is where we all come to agreement. Common grounding is where at least we know that we are a community. So the encounters, for me, it's very important because it has this notion that if there's such incivility in our communities, such deep disagreements, that we don't even bother talking to one another, encounters is a form of dialogue where we can at least notice that we are already in a community. We're in the Hartford Public Library or the Old State House because this is a community institution and we're part of it and we're speaking with other community members. And so we just ask that we always contribute. So share a little bit of yourself in these dialogues. That you acknowledge the other person's beliefs. That doesn't mean you have to affirm them or agree, but at least that you acknowledge that they're coming from a particular viewpoint or life experience. And if there are issues, you always clarify. So you ask a clarifying question like, when you said this, I heard um, this negative statement. Can you just clarify? Now the benefits are, usually it's a disagreement because people aren't used to publicly talking with one another. But also sometimes people are like, no, I meant to say that. Um, so again, it has positive and negatives, but at least you allow the opportunity for someone to clarify their position. Now, moving rather quickly, I'd say in answering our major question for today, is civility necessary for civil discourse? It can be yes and no. That sometimes if you have a form of civility that really cares about cultural differences, that aims for liberatory ends, that knows that our values can be in conflict and is aware of curtailing that, then civility can be a crucial part of having a civil discourse. But there are also other versions um, can we just show respect? Can we have these cultural differences? Can we name it something else? Can we name it justice? So there are other ways that we can have civil discourse that really takes into account cultural differences, modes of respectful communication that doesn't rely on a notion of civility. But as I said, if our goal as CT civic ambassadors is civic health, so how well diverse groups of people actually come together to solve public problems, and strengthen their communities, then I think being aware of cultural differences around communication and civility will actually be very beneficial to our work. And so for round three, because we only have five minutes, I'm just gonna briefly, uh, again, go through the slides because this will all be handed to you. And so it's really a challenge, not only for yourself, but for your community. So I ask, um, how would you challenge your own deeply held beliefs? Or how would you handle a challenge? So if someone says, I deeply disagree with your religious, um, economic, political beliefs, how do you handle that in your own forms of communication? Do you get defensive? Are you open-minded? Um, the second question, how would you handle someone being uncivil towards you? Again, do we get defensive? Do we get into attack mode? Do we shut down? and say, this is just a form of communication I don't want? Or can we ask a clarifying question or really just communicate that the way the person's communicating to us is not something that we find respectful? And lastly, how would you handle wanting to be uncivil to others? So in all forms of dialogue, someone's gonna say something you deeply disagree with. As a facilitator, as a moderator, as an organizer, as a participant, it's going to happen if we're gonna have real conversations 
So what are our own internal mechanisms that we are prepared to enter into a dialogue, enter a debate with, enter any type of civil discourse? And these next two slides are from the Reviving Civility Handbook, which we have actually on the sides. So we're gonna give you the links to these documents. But one thing I really wanted to point out to um, in these slides are that in slide number one, they have questions where you spend 10 to 15 minutes talking about divisions in your community. So really talking about, well, how are we uncivil or disrespectful to one another? How is our community divided? And then in the next slide, or in the next 10 to 15 minutes, they try to bring it back to, well, what do we still agree with? But yes, we have deep disagreements in our community. Every community has deep disagreements. But what do we actually agree across in terms of political, religious differences? What do we share as a community? And then how can we move forward? So instead of just having a conversation of civility, how are we uncivil towards one another? It's really moving the conversation to say that that's not the only thing that defines our community. And so, again, lastly, I just want to give us our resources. So these are the resources I used for this brief presentation. And these are the additional resource links that will be sent out to you. The whole um, PowerPoint will be sent. And I'd also just want to thank our partners, Yukon Humanities Institute, the Humility and Conviction in Public Life Project, Everyday Democracy, particularly Val and Sandy, for their great work on this. And lastly, the Connecticut Civic Ambassadors that really placed the onus on myself to really think critically of how I use civility in my own work and how can we keep on improving. So this is our contact information for both myself and Val. And we would always love more questions or please share this document with others to talk about civic health and be interested in becoming civic ambassadors. So thank you very much, Dana. Uh, this has been a fantastic uh, workshop. We have, uh, I think we could probably spend another five minutes if people are willing to for any questions or comments that uh, they, people have that this presentation has raised for them. Anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, if, if not, then one thing I, I'll mention, Dana, is you talked about cultural differences mm -hmm. uh, and, and in terms of definitions of civility. And it's interesting because I attended the Frontiers of Democracy Conference some years ago and we were having a dialogue about different points of views on issues, something around civility too. And I, I expressed my opinion, you know, in, in a very compelling way, but also emotional, because that's the nature of my, of my culture, I guess. Uh, and uh, one of the persons that was there uh, sort of said, I'm going to push back on what you're saying. And she said it in a polite way, but she used the term push back, which I took that in terms of cultural meaning, I took that as being in a way offensive um, and, and, and sort, of, uh, sort of disrespectful to me. Now, I can understand why she didn't think it was disrespectful. She was obviously using the term, didn't think it was disrespectful. But for me, I felt disrespected. And so that's an example of, even in a conversation when you can have a, two people talking with a normal tone of voice, uh, or one of them more emotional and the other not, uh, how the use of certain words can also trigger certain kinds of you know, uh, responses. Uh, in this case, the sense of feeling disrespected. Mm -hmm. So the words we choose also, uh, I think are also important. Uh, when we disagree with someone, how we disagree, what is the words that we use are also important in terms of the different cultural meanings and uh, nuances, that, as you mentioned earlier. No, and I completely agree, particularly as a philosopher, I found not only in my training or classroom, that if I'm talking about a particular subject that also impacts me, I can have the claim of not being objective. And so using that term um, for me is a way of shutting me down or until I learn that. So I just disagree with that terminology that I can be passionate about a subject 
but I'm still doing it in a way that's respectful. So I think the terms we use, the manners or behaviors that we dictate in our conversations or dialogues can either serve to alienate people or bring them in. But if we're not intentional about it, then we're just letting it happen. Um, and so if we have the intention moving in our dialogues, moving in our conversations, that this is possible and I have to be careful and inform people and work on it myself, then I just think we have better dialogues. Absolutely. Any any other comments or questions from any of the participants? Uh, there is in the chat box, Dana. I think um, Steve has a question for you. Steve, you, your audio should be working if you want to just ask it. Sure, Dana, just what, when, when do you think these concepts can be realistically taught to students? At what age? I mean, I know you could start this at kindergarten, but realistically, is, should it be kindergarten, or when do you think this could be introduced to students? So I think in terms of, you can introduce um, middle schoolers to our structured dialogue, and I think it could go very well. I, I, I don't say I want to experiment or test case my cousins, um, but I do. <laughs> um, but even with kindergarten, I think you can teach them concepts. So I teach my kindergarten, um, my cousin who's in kindergarten now in first grade, the concept of what respect is. And so like, hey, respect me, what does that mean? And now how can you share that with others? So I think just having a program where students um, really learn through K to 12, just ways of actually being in communication with each other, that's actually either civil or respectful, can actually be beneficial. So when they get to middle school, they can actually have a structured dialogue and know the themes and operative values of why they're doing it. So if you don't teach them the reason why these values are important, then they, they can take part in the civil discourse. But again, it's rope. Um, they don't really see the meaning behind it. They don't see it operating in other communities or in popular media. So I think just having a program where we're learning the values that we want in a civil discourse way beforehand, and then we're actually doing it probably in middle school, um, but again, I mostly work and have chosen to work with older students. So middle schoolers are usually the youngest I work with. Um, I'd have to talk more with my sister who teaches first grade, um, if that's possible. That's a good point, Dana. Thank you. One Thank of the you. things that, you know, that my kids, I talk the most when somebody's talking to you, if you disagree, wait until they finish expressing their opinion. Don't interrupt them. Because that is disrespectful. That's uncivil. Uh, and also then it gives you an opportunity to really pay attention to what that person is saying. Mm -hmm. If you interrupt them, you're not going to let them finish what they were saying. So that's one example of things that maybe you could even teach your kids as, as early as elementary school at, at home, you know. And I think parents can play a role in doing that, in being teachers of civil behavior and conduct with their children. And I also saw that Lisa, although she might have left, but she also talked about how technology, um, the technology used can lead to misinterpretation. So we're on a Zoom event with audio, might be going in and out, um, and it's also not face-to-face. -face. Um, that can also lead to some misinterpretations where, again, audio is cutting out. We only have an hour. Um, people can't stay because they're not in the same room. So I think with this Zoom event, I really like the way we're able to incorporate the chat box. So if your audio is not working, we're still going to let you be heard in a chat box. So always being aware of just different forms of communication and making anything you can available to have people's voices being heard. OK, any last comments or questions? So I want to thank you, Dana. Really, thank you very much for sharing with us these insights uh, and this knowledge that you gained from your experience as co-facilitator, moderator of the uh, Initiative on Campus Dialogues and also the Encounter Series, as well as the research you've done over the years on this topic. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to learn more about the Connecticut Civic Ambassadors Program. I won't have time to talk a little bit more about it, but we will send all of you information about becoming a civic ambassador and uh, learning uh, through these kinds of 
uh, online and also live activities and programs that we will be sponsoring in the fall, in addition, of course, to the summit that we will be having in late November. And we will be bringing speakers and others to talk about these topics. Uh, so we hope that you will continue to remain interested in being a civic ambassador, or if you're not a member, please contact us and I'll be glad to send you information. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, Tina, thank you Sorry as well. for interrupting. Do you want to just uh, remind folks of the event coming up Saturday at the Hartford Public Library? Yes, thank you for reminding me, Sandy. We have an event that is sponsored by uh, an organization uh, and it's, it's, in called, it's called Power, I forget the title, it Power Powerful Purpose, Powerful Purpose Hartford. It's a, uh, a town hall meeting happening at the Hartford Public Library this Saturday, May 11th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, there's information available online uh, on Facebook and it's called Power for Purpose Hartford. Uh, and uh, if you would like more information, contact us and I'll send you the link. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you, Dane, again. And have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.